and welcome to this digital literacy masterclass. I want to appreciate you all that you turned up for this program. You are not here by accident, but by divine arrangement. In this program, I will be taking you on a journey to demystify the digital world that you and I are living in. You know, many people have thought that learning digital technology is daunting, especially if all you have ever worked with is analog. So it's time to put those worries to rest. You know, with the right tools and training, you can navigate the digital world with confidence. Whether you're a student, a professional, a business owner, a parent, or a senior, digital literacy is an essential skill for the 21st century and it's never too late to learn. I have tried as much as possible to make this masterclass beginners friendly and starting out we will be dealing with some theoretical explanations in order to lay a proper foundation before diving deeper into the practical sections. At some point during the practical sessions, uh, I will be demonstrating on screen how to actually carry out the procedures. I will be explaining in this masterclass so that you can either practice along with me or later after the class. This will help you to better understand the various concepts. So what are the goals and objectives of this masterclass? You know, by the end of this program, you will be able to apply all you have learned with ease and confidence empowering you to digitally communicate, collaborate, and create like never before, especially in real-world applications. Now, these are the goals and objectives that I intend to achieve for the whole master class. Number one, you will be able to understand what digital literacy is and why it is important. The second goal is that you are going to learn about digital technologies, communication tools, and uh, networks as the three major aspects of digital literacy. And the third goal is files management and sharing. The fourth one is you're going to learn how to create and share digital content. And the fifth goal is you're going to know how to stay safe and secure your work online. And the sixth one is you're going to understand how to find and evaluate online information. And many more topics on the way, you know, you're going to find this masterclass interesting. And of course, like I've said in the group, it's completely free. So all you need is your determination to learn your laptop and of course, high speed internet to get connected. So let's hit the ground running. Are you ready? All right, let's talk about digital literacy. What is it and why is it important? Digital literacy is actually the ability to use digital technology, online communication tools and networks to locate, evaluate, use, create and share digital information while protecting your personal information and privacy online. Digital literacy is becoming increasingly important in today's society as technology is integrated into more aspects of our daily lives. So I'm going to buttress this point with my true life story. So I want you to listen and uh, learn a few things from my true life story. I am Timmy Tokwe Wokale. I studied electrical and electronic engineering with over 17 years of experience while in higher institution Digital literacy happened to be one of the courses I studied. And as a matter of fact, in my first diploma, computer technology was my final project. This made me fall in love with anything digital, and it really paid me well. Before getting my first official job in 2005, I was already a computer enthusiast. And with my digital literacy skills, I was serving in my local church as the assistant secretary of the church council and that was where grace found me so what happened well an indigenous oil and gas service company in nigeria created a new strategic business unit also known as svu around 2004 or 2005 or thereabout to handle a brand new premium product line that was to serve shell company i know many of you are familiar with spdc shell petroleum development company in Nigeria. So they they needed some electrical engineers to pioneer the project. 
So fortunately for me, I already acquired some basic digital literacy skills and was already using that to help the church council. So it happened that a member of the church council was a friend of the MD of the company. The branch MD, so to say, you know, because the CEO stays in the headquarters in Lagos. Since I already finished the first stage of my academic journey and I was ready for employment, this God-fearing man decided to appreciate my service for the church council and that was how he linked me up with the MD for a quick interview. Of course, he already told the MD that I studied electrical engineering and computer technology. And so, during the interview, his major questions were, Are you computer literate? Can you handle digital devices and programs? Of course, I said yes, <laughs> in affirmation. Which, of course, I later demonstrated in his office the following day. And that was how I got the job within 24 hours. Later on, one thing led to another. I was sent abroad two times in 2007 and 2008 for further training. And before I could say Jack, I became the head of the same department that was newly established. And it's his figures. And the position also came with an official car. You can imagine. So I want you to pay attention to the process. First, I acquired some digital lit literacy skills. I associated myself with people that matter, in my case, the church council, filled with high-profile people. Then I helped my local church council for free with my digital skills. Later on, I got networked with an MD of a reputed company. Then from there, I got my first employment and trained abroad two times. Then I came back to Nigeria and started a family that was in 2009. From there, after some years with my family, we finally moved back to Europe permanently. And the rest, they say, is history. So you can see the way the Creator made everything work together by using the skill that I had to pave the way for me. And of course, I am grateful to God for that. In addition to my technical expert expertise, I am also a passionate life strategist. Ever since I have realized that the process I described earlier worked for me and that it's no respect of persons or locations, I started teaching the same process to several other individuals which have, have helped uh, and the process has helped them achieve their personal, marital, and professional goals. And of course, my first major mentee was my wife. I fondly call her my divine project and that I must do everything possible to help her succeed even more than myself. So I enrolled her in some digital literacy programs as an addendum to her previously acquired skills and professional qualifications. She too started using her skills to help others free of charge. I also explained to her about networking on LinkedIn. She registered her profile on LinkedIn and that was where she was contacted from Europe and given an international offer in the nursing profession. There are of course several other mentees who have passed through my mentorship and are either doing well in Nigeria or they have traveled abroad for better opportunities. So, without even saying much further, you know now how, Im how powerful and important digital literacy is, right? It is without a doubt an essential skill in today's fast-paced world. As we continue to embrace the digital age, it is imperative that we equip ourselves with the knowledge and skills to navigate this terrain. So I'm excited to share my expertise and knowledge with you all and I am confident that together we can take our digital literacy skills to the next level. All right, enough dilly darling. Let's proceed and let's go deeper into the real deal. So why am I doing this? Why are we doing this? You see, the nursing profession, for example, has undergone significant changes with the advancement of technology. 
For example, let's look at patient documentation. In the past, nurses used to keep paper records of patient information such as medical history, medications, allergies, and vital signs. Today, because of technology, nurses use electronic health records, also known as EHRs, to enter patient data which can be accessed by authorized healthcare providers from any location. For those traveling abroad or those planning on traveling abroad, you will be working with a lot of these things I'm sharing with you. So it's better you get prepared and get ready. And um, another example is about medication administration. In the past, nurses used to manually record medication administration times and dosages on paper charts. Today, electronic medication and ad administration records are used to track and record medication administration, reducing the risk of errors and improving patient safety. Let, let's look at the third example. Communication. In the past, nurses used to rely on face-to-face -face or telephone communication with other healthcare providers. Today, Digital communication tools such as email, text messaging, and video conferencing are used to communicate with other healthcare providers, allowing for more efficient and timely communication. The fourth one is uh, patient education. You know, in the past, nurses used to provide patient education using printed materials or face to face interactions. Or print manual flyers and all of that but today nurses use uh, they use digital tools such as patient portals interactive apps and educational videos to provide patient education making it more accessible and engaging let's look at monitoring in the past nurses used to manually monitor patients vital signs such as blood pressure heart rate and oxygen levels. Today, digital mount monitoring tools such as uh, wearable devices and remote monitoring systems allow for continuous monitoring and real-time data collection. So thereby making it easier to identify changes in a patient's condition and provide timely interventions. And there are so many more examples that time will not permit me to share with you in this program but I believe you already understand where I'm going. So, this is why it is actually crucial for individuals to have a basic understanding of how to use digital tools effectively and responsibly in order to participate fully in the digital world and to make informed decisions about digital information and communication. You remember in the definition of digital literacy I provided earlier, you will notice three major aspects of it. For the purpose of this discussion, I will call them tools. And they are number one, digital technology, number two, online communication tools, and number three, networks. So let me break it down further for better understanding. Number one, digital technology. So it's actually an aspect of digital literacy and it refers to any electronic device, tool or software that uses digital information. Examples are your desktop computers, laptops, smartphones, tablets, digital cameras, printers, scanners and other electronic devices that are used to create, process, store and share digital information. Digital technology also includes the software and applications that run on these devices, such as operating system like Windows, iOS, or Android, etc. Then examples like productivity software, creative software, web browsers, and social media applications. So all these are also examples of digital technology. You know, when I I mentioned productivity software, I actually meant 
softwares like Adobe Acrobat Reader or Adobe Suite, Microsoft Office Suite like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, etc. Then other productivity softwares include Google Workspace or Google Cloud like Google Drive, Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Google Gmail and all of that. Then we also have productivity softwares from Apple, Apple iWork, e.g. Pages, Numbers, Keynote, etc. And there are so many other examples of productivity software. Uh, I also mentioned creativity software. Softwares like Canva, InVideo, DaVinci Resolve, OBS, Adobe Creative Clouds like Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Adobe Premiere Pro, etc. We use all of these for design, for creativity, all forms of designs. Then another example of uh, digital technologies uh, are the web browsers, of course, like Google, Chrome, Mozilla, Firefox. Microsoft Edge, Apple Safari, Opera, Brave, Vivaldi, Tor Browser, Chromium, SeaMonkey, and all of that. So any of these softwares that I've mentioned can be installed on your digital devices, depending on your needs and preferences. So let's look deeper into the first and the most important item on the list of digital technologies. And it is the computer system. It's very important because everything that we are going to be doing in this master class depends on the computer system. So for the purpose of this master class, I will be using a Microsoft Windows computer for all my explanations. So apologies to Apple users. <laughs> so when you hear the word Windows PC, it means a computer that is run by Microsoft's Windows operating system. I'm going to expand more on that later, so pay attention and listen. Of course, their major competitor is Apple that manufactures Macintosh computers, Mac for short. You know, it's fondly called Mac. We use Mac, <laughs> but well, it's actually Macintosh if you want to pronounce it in full. And these computers are run with Mac OS, that is Mac operating system. Uh, there are other computers, of course, but I won't touch on those ones for now because I don't want you to feel overwhelmed with loads of information. So, but before I continue, I want us to look at the some major differences between Windows computer and Macintosh computer. You know, Windows is uh, manufactured by Microsoft, while Macintosh is uh, manufactured by Apple. M many people understand this. But, like I said earlier, this masterclass is beginner friendly, so I'm going to be d making my. I'll be going to be explaining, you know, so that beginners or starters can actually grasp as much information as possible. So if you already understood these concepts, of course, just see it as a retouch to your knowledge or a refresher course. <laughs> All right, let's continue. So some of the differences. Windows run, Windows is a singular now, of course. Windows runs on computers made by a variety of manufacturers, not just Microsoft while Mac runs on computers made by only Apple. And these computers use Mac operating system, like I said earlier. The second difference is Windows is known for its flexibility and wide range of software compatibility, while Mac operating system is known for its stability. When I say stability, I mean it's seamless and uh, this seamless integration between the computer system and the operating system actually make the company to stand out and to offer premium prices. So, and both are made by the same company, Apple. So it, it makes it more stable, and you know. 
And the third difference is that it's about their business strategy. The business strategy used by Apple with its Mac operating system is called a closed or proprietary system. While the strategy used by Microsoft with its Windows operating system is called an open or non-proprietary system. Don't worry, I'm going to explain <laughs> more about that. A closed or proprietary system means that the hardware and software are tightly integrated and controlled by the same company. As is this is the case with Apple, of course. So this can provide better optimization and reliability. But it also means that users are limited to hardware options provided by the company. And that is why all Apple products appear to be more expensive than Microsoft products. Now, open and non-proprietary system means that the software can run on a variety of hardware from different manufacturers. So, which means it is not only Microsoft that is manufacturing all the computers that run Windows operating system. So, this can provide more uh, hardware options and potentially lower prices, of course. But it can also lead to compatibility issues, you know. And uh, it may also require more effort from the user to maintain the system. But then that's just a small issue because if you don't want to have compatibility issues, that's why you need to observe very well and pay attention to what you're buying. And that's exactly what I'll be including in this masterclass. I'm going to be showing you, explaining to you what you need to look out for before you buy your digital devices, especially your laptop or your smartphones. Now, Let's look at some hardware and software components that you need to be familiar with when using a computer system or, or, or smartphone in your digital literacy journey. The first one is the hardware, of course, very important. Under the hardware section, I'll be talking about the central processing unit. The central processing unit, CPU for short, is the brain of the computer. It is a physical component that is located on the computer's motherboard. It is responsible for executing instructions and performing calculations for the computer. It processes all the instructions given to it by the software and also performs calculations and operations. So I'm going to be showing you the image of how the CPU looks like. You can see. Then the second item under the hardware is the RAM, which is random access memory. It's actually a type of memory that the computer uses to temporarily store data while it's being processed. So it's actually different from your hard disk, which will be the third thing I will be talking about. The hard disk or the hard drive. It comes in two forms. It could be hard disk drive or solid state drive, HDD or SSD. SSD happens to be modern and it is now mostly used by many people. It's a permanent storage device that holds everything from your operating system to your personal files. Then another important item under the hardware section is the graphics processing unit, GPU for short. It is responsible for rendering images and graphics. So it's especially important for gaming and other graphically intensive applications. Other hardware components that are not found inside the computer system but are still useful to perform computer operations can be divided into input devices, output devices, and peripherals. So let's look at input devices. These are devices used to provide information or data to the computer system. For example, the keyboard. It's an input device that allows users to input letters, numbers, and other characters into a computer system. The mouse is a device used to move a cursor or pointer on a computer screen and make selections. The scanner 
It's a device that captures images and text from paper documents and converts them into digital form that can be used by a computer or that can be sent to someone or somewhere. The microphone, the one like the one I'm using right now, it's actually another example of an input device because it captures sound and converts it into digital form that can be used by a computer. Another example is the webcam. It's a camera that captures video and images and sends them to a computer system. Now let's look at output devices. These are devices used to display or present data or information processed by a computer system. For example, the monitor. It's an output device. It displays images, text, and other visual information generated by a computer system. The printer is another example of an output device that produces hard copies of text or images from a computer system. The projector is also a very good example of an output device. It helps to display images and videos on a large screen or wall for presentations or entertainment. Speakers. <laughs> Speakers are also good examples of output devices. They produce sound and output from a computer system. Now let's look at the peripherals. What are peripherals? Peripherals are actually devices that can be connected to a computer system to enhance its functionality. They may not necessarily be part of the computer system, but they are just other addendum, you know, additional devices that are connected to a computer system. For example, external hard drive. Apart from the fact that computer system has its own internal hard drive called HDD or SSD, your computer can also have, you know, you can get an extra external hard drive if you happen to work with loads of files and folders all the time, especially for video creators and uh, graphic designers. So it's actually a device used to store or backup data from a computer system. Then another one is USB flash drive. It's a portable storage device that can be used to transfer files between computers. CD and or DVD drive is another good example of a peripheral. It's a device used to read or write data from or to CDs and DVDs. Graphics tablet, a device that allows users to draw and impute images or sketches into a computer system. Gamepad is also another example of a peripheral. It's a controller used to play video games or on, on a computer system. Alright, um, well, since the majority of you listening to me are nurses, so I'm going to explain the computer system further using the human body because there are some similarities between the parts and functions of a computer system and of course the central nervous system of the body but there are also some key differences so in terms of similarities both a computer system and the central nervous system process and transmit information a computer system actually does this by receiving input either by way of a, a keyboard or a mouse it processes it and produces an output while the central nervous system does its own by receiving sensory input from the body processes it in the brain and produces motor output that controls movement and behavior of the affected area so in a computer system the central processing unit is like the brain in the human body processing data and execu executing instructions. The RAM that I talked about earlier and the hard disk or the SSD are like the short-term and long-term memories of the brain respectively. The hard disk or SSD is the long-term memory while the RAM is the short-term memory. You can also call both of them your conscious and subconscious mind. RAM, since it's short or temporary memory, 
you can liken it to be the conscious mind while the hard disk or the SSD that is the permanent memory of the computer you can liken that to be the subconscious mind so information deposited in the subconscious mind stays there longer than information deposited in the conscious mind so and then of course the input and output devices are like the sensory and motor nerves of the body's peripheral nervous system uh, despite that there are also some important differences between the two systems the central nervous system is a biological system of course that has evolved over millions of years while a computer system is a man-made technology and uh, the central nervous system is also much more complex and adaptable than any computer system with billions of neurons and complex connections between them that can change over time so that is it just I, I decided to touch on that aspect for you to actually comprehend or appreciate the fact that probably the inventors of the computer system looked at the human body before coming up with that idea because the similarities are so glaring all right now we've touched on the hardware part of the computer system so let me briefly touch on I'll touch on the software part as well because very important so the software part of a computer system consists of programs applications and data that are used to operate and manage the computer hardware and uh, I've just mentioned a few of them number one operating system really important it is a primary software that controls and manages the hardware resources of the computer system and uh, examples include Microsoft uh, Windows Microsoft Windows Macintosh operating system and Linux like I earlier said I'll be focusing more on Windows Microsoft Windows because it's more popular uh, let's talk about applications these are they are actually software programs that perform specific tasks or functions on the computer such as word processing photo editing or web browsing then another software part of the computer system is called utilities these are software programs that are used to maintain and optimize the performance of the computer system such as disk cleanup virus scanners and backup tools how about device drivers it's also another example they are the software programs that allow the computer to communicate with and control hardware devices such as printers scanners and sound cards let's talk about programming languages because they are also a very good example of uh, the soft uh, software part of the computer system programming languages like Java Python C++ and all of that and they are used to write software programs and applications how about firmware it's actually a type of software that is embedded in hardware devices such as the BIOS firmware that is used to boot up the computer system uh, let me expand more on that BIOS means BIOS and it stands for basic input output system it is actually a type of firmware that is installed on the motherboard of a computer system it's actually responsible for initializing and configuring the hardware components of the computer when it is first powered on so when the computer is powered on the BIOS check uh, the BIOS it checks the hardware components to ensure that they are functioning properly and uh, this is known as the power on self test that is post power on self test if any issues are detected during post the BIOS will generate error messages and prevent the system from booting up 
So after the hardware is checked and configured, the BIOS then loads the operating system from the boot device, such as the hard drive or a USB drive. The BIOS also provides a set of basic system functions, such as reading from and writing to the hard drive and communicating with input and output devices like the keyboard and mouse. So now let's talk about how to access your PC or your computer. To access your Windows PC, you need to turn on your computer. You find the button, the power button somewhere around the computer. When your computer starts up, you will see the Windows logo on the screen and then you will be taken to something called the desktop. The desktop is actually like a big digital workspace where you can see all of your files, folders and programs. You can access different parts of Windows by clicking on things like icons, buttons, menus or start exploring from the start button or this PC icon. For example, if you want to open a program like Microsoft Word, you can click on the Start menu, which is usually located in the lower left corner of the screen, and then click on the Word icon. You can also use your keyboard and mouse to interact with Windows. For example, you can use your mouse to move the cursor around the screen, and you can use your keyboard to type things like letters and numbers. Windows has lots of different features and settings that you can explore as you become more comfortable using it. But don't worry, you don't need to know everything right away. Just take your time and remember that Windows is here to help you do all sorts of cool things on your computer. Now, like I promised earlier that I was going to uh, explain to you some of the things you need to look out for before you buy your computer system. Now, uh, your smartphone, of course. So, but let me start with your computer system like laptop and desktop. If you are looking to get a new Windows laptop for your digital literacy journey, there are several things you need to consider before making the purchase. And uh, the first one on my list is the processor. It's very important. The processor is the brain of your laptop. Or your computer and it's responsible for handling all the calculations and uh, processes that your computer needs to run you know you need to look for a laptop with a modern processor such as an Intel Core i5 or i7 or an AMD Ryzen processor those are the commonly used ones and they are very good then you also need to consider the RAM the RAM is very important like I explained earlier, RAM means random access memory. It's where your computer stores data that is currently using and is a temporary memory. So the more RAM your laptop has, the faster it will be able to multitask and run multiple programs simultaneously. So you need to look for a laptop with at least 8 gig of RAM. 8 gig. Now let's talk about storage, which is also very important. You want to make sure that your laptop is, you know, big enough. It has enough storage space, or you know, to hold all of your files and programs. You need to look for a laptop with at least two hundred and fifty-six gigabyte, even though it's small to my liking. Maybe you can start with five hundred gig. From there, you can upgrade to one terabyte. One terabyte means one thousand. Uh, gigabyte and uh, consider getting a laptop with a solid state drive because that is the modern modern uh, memory permanent memory that people use nowadays it's faster than HDD hard disk drive you know if you really want your PC to perform faster so get a laptop or a desktop that has SSD Let's talk about display. You know, a good display can make a big difference when it comes to digital literacy. So you have to look for a PC with a high resolution display 
at least 1080 pixel and consider getting the la a laptop with an I, uh, IPS uh, panel for better viewing angles. Let's talk about battery life. If you plan to use your laptop on the go, especially while traveling or while in a remote location, so you want to make sure that it has a good battery life. So you have to look for a laptop with at least six to eight hours of battery life. So all of these key important uh, features must be put into consideration. Then another thing is the operating system. Like I mentioned earlier, Windows laptop, you know, I'm dealing with Windows. It's important to decide which version of Windows you prefer. The latest for now is Windows 11. But many laptops still come with Windows 10 installed. So, but Windows 10 is still working pretty well. So, but then look for Windows 11, which is the latest. Now let's talk about the price. Finally, you will want to consider your budget. A good Windows laptop can range from a few hundred dollars to well over a thousand. So you have to figure out how much you are willing to spend before making a purchase. So I think by considering all the factors I've mentioned, you'll be able to find a Windows laptop that meets your needs for your digital literacy journey. Very important. So let's let's talk about smartphones. Of course, the same rule app, the, the same rules apply to smartphones, especially Android. Uh, Android is actually an example of operating system for smartphones. I've explained that in the beginning of this uh, program you know while android is for some smartphones ios is also for some other smartphones so obviously windows operating system windows and android are winning the global market share in the digital technology all right so if you are looking to get an Android smartphone for your digital literacy journey, you need to consider also the processor, like I mentioned about laptop. So processor is important. It is the brain of your smartphone and it's responsible for handling all the calculations and processes that your phone needs to run. So look for smartphones with a modern processor like uh, Qualcomm, Snapdragon, Samsung, Exynos processor, or you can look for Huawei Kirin processor. Now let's talk about RAM, random access memory. That's where your phone stores data that is it's currently using. The more RAM your phone has, the faster it will be able to multitask and run multiple apps simultaneously. So look for a smartphone with at least four gig RAM or 6 gig or 8 gig so like i said the higher the faster the higher the better to do more demanding tasks then another important thing you need to look out for is the storage you want to make sure your phone has enough storage space to hold all of your apps photos and other files so look for a phone with at least 64 gig of storage and consider getting a phone with a micro SD card slot if you want to expand the storage later. Some phones or modern phones don't come with uh, they don't come with external micro SD slot, so they have their internal memory well optimized, like up to like 128 gig or 256 gig or even 500 gig internal memory. So there are some phones like that, like Samsung products. So depending on your budget, make sure you also get something that is big enough for your digital literacy journey. Now let's talk about the display. A good display is actually important for reading, browsing the web and watching videos. So you have to look for a phone with a high resolution display, at least 1080 pixel. And consider getting a phone with an AMOLED or OLED panel for better color reproduction and contrast. 
Let's talk about battery life, which is very, very crucial. If you plan to use your phone throughout the day, you will want to make sure it has a good battery life. Look for a phone with at least 3000 milliamps hour of battery capacity. And consider getting a phone with uh, fast charging or wireless charging if you want to be able to quickly charge your phone. How about operating system? The latest version of Android is Android 12. But many phones still come with Android 11 installed. So consider the manufacturer's track record of software updates and uh, security patches as you want to keep your phone secure and up to date. How about price? You know, you want to look at your budget, like I said about uh, a laptop. So a good Android smartphone can range from a few hundred dollars to well over a thousand. So you have to figure out how much you are willing to spend before making a purchase. Uh, I think about uh, $300 or if you are a Nigerian, about 220,000 Naira should be enough, you know, starting out. So it should be good enough for a beginner. So when you consider all of these factors that I've mentioned, so you'll be able to find an Android smartphone that meets your needs for digital literacy. So uh, if you have any questions, of course, don't forget to drop them in the comment section of this video or you can drop them in our group, Telegram group. So I'm going to drop the link to our Telegram group in the comment section or in the description of this video. So join us and throw in your questions. Now let's quickly look at the second aspect of digital literacy, online communication tools. Just as the name implies, you use them for online communication. Uh, for example, email. Email is an electronic messaging system used to communicate with individuals or group of people. Examples include Gmail, Outlook, Yahoo Mail and Apple Mail. So in this masterclass, I will be using Gmail for most of my demonstrations as it is versatile and can be used to automatically log into so many digital platforms and softwares. Instant messaging is another example of online communication tools. Under instant messaging, you have things like WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Telegram, iMessage for Apple users, etc. Another thing is video conferencing. It's actually a digital tool that enables face-to-face -face communication with individuals or groups of people over a network. Examples like Zoom, Skype, Google Meet, and Microsoft Teams, and uh, so on and so forth. And social media is another good example. It's actually a digital platform that enables users to connect and share information with individuals or groups of people. Examples like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, etc. We also have discussion forums. They are actually online platforms for individuals to share information and participate in discussions with others who share similar interests or goals. For example, in Nigeria, we have Naira Land. It's a very popular forum, discussion forum. In other parts of the world, we have Reddit, Quora, Stack Exchange, and Discourse. That is it for the second aspect of digital literacy. Uh, in subsequent classes, I will still be expanding more on all of this. Like I said earlier, this is just the beginner friendly, or let me just call it the introductory part of this masterclass. Just like laying a foundation. So don't expect uh, too much from this. But subsequent trainings, I'll be going deeper and taking each of these topics one by one, then show you how to use them and master them. Now, the third aspect of digital literacy is networks. And uh, the first one is local area network, also known as LAN. It's actually a network that connects devices within a limited geographic area, such as home or office. Examples like Wi-Fi networks within a home that you are you, you you use to link computers and phones together through cables and all of that. 
either at home or in the in your office and we also use like ethernet networks so all of these fall under lan category then wide area networks or one is a network that connects devices across larger geographic areas such as multiple offices or cities examples like internet cellular networks and satellite networks then another thing is world wide web which is an interconnected system of web pages and websites that are accessible over the internet like google wikipedia amazon youtube etc then we also have peer to peer networks where devices communicate directly with one another without a central server in order to share resources or information then we also have cloud computing it's actually a network of servers and resources that can be accessed remotely over the internet examples like amazon web services microsoft azure uh, google cloud platforms and dropbox uh, in this master class of course in my subsequent training i will be focusing more on google cloud platforms or workspaces and i'm going to share my screen with you so you know how these things work the truth is they are not that rocket science anybody can use them essentially when you have learned and to some extent mastered how to effect effectively use any or all of the digital technologies i've mentioned so far with their corresponding communication tools and networks then you are said to be digitally literate when you now add that to your profession whether engineering or nursing with the right attitude i can guarantee that you will be on top of the world that is it for this class like i said this is going to be a series that i'm going to be dropping more videos dropping more programs on this master class as i call it master class it's a huge and broad uh, topic i'll be taking them in bite size for better understanding and comprehension so if you have any questions so far don't forget to drop them in the comment section or go to our telegram group to submit your questions and of course that will really help me to prepare my next uh, class so that it will be more focus oriented i'll be able to focus it more on your questions so thank you for listening for staying till the end of this program i remain see you next time in my next uh, podcast and production don't forget do me this favor to give a like to this video subscribe to my channel and uh, share to as many people as possible because this is free i'm offering this training free of charge